And then we start to think about, well, how, how are we going to tell this story? I mean, you know this from Ship of Dreams, you know, how are we going to tell this story? We, we have a great story, but now how do we tell it and how do we tell it visually? And I thought, no sweat, we will compare it to Titanic. It's, a, it's an all-time maritime disaster, huge loss of life. We'll compare it to Titanic and everybody will understand, both, both in China and uh, elsewhere, you know, people will understand with that frame of reference. And then as I started to sort of go back through my Titanic, you know, bookshelf, which I, which I had, you know, which both of you have, of course, which many of our listeners have. And, uh, and as I started to read through some of that material and also look at some of the more recent uh, scholarship that had been done, I, I came across the story of uh, the Chinese sailors that had been on Titanic. And I, I know I had seen it before. It was not the first time I had ever seen it, but you know, like just about everybody else, I think I clicked on it and read it and said, wow, that's interesting and there's not that much there. Titanic Talk with Nelson Aspen and Alexandra Boyd. Here we feature stories from the independent documentary Ship of Dreams Titanic Movie Diaries and everything else to do with the iconic ship. From James Cameron's epic groundbreaking movie to the history and legacy of Titanic herself. Join us and our special guests as we continue the 25th anniversary celebrations of Titanic. This is your first class ticket to everything aboard the Ship of Dreams. I'm Nelson Aspen and it's another episode of Titanic Talk. And in this wonderful web that we are a part of, of, of Titanic enthusiasts. Uh, our, our colleague and friend, L.A. Reed Beatles, introduced us to today's guest. And uh, he's, even, he's even wearing some of her merch because we don't have any Titanic Talk merch to sell yet, but maybe someday we will. Uh, Alexandra Boyd, my co-host from Ship of Dreams Titanic Movie Diaries, will you do the honors of introducing our very special guest? Well, very special. And I feel a fellow uh, uh, friendship because we're both filmmakers and we both made a film about this ship called Titanic. Stephen Schweiker, thank you so much for coming. Um, participant, writer, and in an amazing documentary called The Six, which we're going to talk about in depth with him today. Yeah, and S Stephen is a, a not just a filmmaker, he's a researcher, he's an adventurer. Um, we, we got to meet in person and we went out to lunch and he actually, I mean, he's a real explorer. He's a, he's a man of science and he's, he's an adventurer. And what, what the six is about, and I'll leave it to Stephen to explain, but it, it started out for me when I watched it is like, okay, well, this is an, a as a Titanic enthusiast myself, this is a Titanic story, but it's really so much more. It's a whole mystery uh, about science and life and so much, so much deeper, if you pardon the pun. Stephen, tell us, tell us the, the elevator pitch of the six, for those who don't know. Well, well, thank you both for having me. Um, it's 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 really an honor, um, and and I, I hope that our listeners will take uh, take your gracious introduction with a grain of salt. I'm I'm much less a <laughs> filmmaker and man of science. I think all that just says is is that I'm a dilettante. But um, the um, for the six, I mean, <laughs> excuse me, the six started out. Uh, my my partner, the real the real filmmaker, Arthur Jones. Um, who has been a, a friend of mine for 20 something years and, and was, you know, before we ever started out um, working on a Titanic documentary together. Um, we had made a previous documentary about a, a sunken uh, British submarine off of China. We were both living in China at the time I was in Beijing, he was in Shanghai. We had a really good time making the documentary. He made the film, I wrote a book about it. Um, and we thought, wow, that was great. Um, we didn't What's really make any called? money, so but people can look for it. Sure, the documentary is called the Poseidon Project. Uh, you can find it on Vimeo, and the book is called Poseidon. And just use my last name to find it. Otherwise, it's the 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 uh, the subtitle is so long we wouldn't have time on the podcast for me to <laughs> say it fully. So we we did that, and um, you know we we didn't really make any money from it, but we didn't we didn't really lose any money, and it didn't. That wasn't the point anyway. So we thought, well, that was fun. You know, what are what are we going to do next? And I mean, I 
I have loved maritime. I'm a native of New Jersey. I, I live in New Jersey again now. Uh, I'm about three miles from the ocean, you know, as we speak. Um, and, and, you know, the ocean and the things that live in it and the things that end up in it have always fascinated me. And, um, you know, then when I was a teenager, I ended up in China and I was sort of separated from that, my own sort of maritime heritage. And then, you know, suddenly via Poseidon, they were, they were able to come back together again. So um, I had quite a number of these projects in mind, you know, great shipwreck tales from China that have never been told, certainly not to a Western audience or an international audience. And I thought, you know, this is great. Let's, let's keep going. So we were actually looking at a, at a Shanghai shipwreck from the late 1940s, sort of the, the Chinese civil war period. And uh, we had actually gotten six or seven months down the track on that. We had interviewed some survivors and, you know, done some archival work and so forth. And then we started to think about, well, how how are we going to tell this story? I mean, you know this from Ship of Dreams. You know, how are we going to tell this story? We we have a great story, but now how do we tell it and how do we tell it visually? And I thought, no sweat. We will compare it to Titanic. It's a it's an all-time maritime disaster, huge loss of life. We'll compare it to Titanic, and everybody will understand, both both in China and uh elsewhere, you know, people will understand with that frame of reference. And then as I started to sort of go back through my Titanic, you know, bookshelf, which I which I had, you know, which both of you have, of course, which many of our listeners have. And uh, and as I started to read through some of that material and also look at some of the more recent uh, scholarship that had been done, I, I came across the story of uh, the Chinese sailors that had been on Titanic. And I, I know I had seen it before. It was not the first time I had ever seen it, but you know, like just about everybody else, I think I clicked on it and read it and said, wow, that's interesting. And there's not that much there and went on to the next topic. And, and um, certainly we, the... we looked into that story also, even though <clears throat> I've leaned into the diaries that the actors wrote and the fans who keep this flame alive of the story of Titanic, uh, because there is a deleted scene. Uh, again, as the as the real aficionados of the film know, there is a deleted scene of one of the sailors, the Chinese sailors on the piece, the panel of wood, which is where Jim got the idea to actually transfer that story to the, the Rose and Jack element of the story um but it's all it's all touched upon and again there's there's so many stories that a, a 90 minute film which is all i had and a, a three hour film is all that james cameron had you, you just can't tell them all so you got to tell the story but you had a lot of research to do first well absolutely i mean you know i think seeing that scene seeing that deleted scene i mean it, unfortunately it revealed that i hadn't watched every single bit of my you know two dvd collector set of titanic <laughs> um that had also been sitting on the titanic bookshelf um but you know it, it, this time when i when i stumbled on that piece of information it really grabbed me and i thought you know but what what happened to these guys you know why why don't we know their story you know to you know with all due respect i mean it seems like every you know person from ireland that was on the ship we know everything about them and and you know so many of the passengers we know their stories and it, it's it, you know credit to all the researchers who have done uh, all the homework on that but these were among you know the 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 part of the story that that really was still not told and I thought, but why don't we know that? Where, where are those diaries? Where are those books? Where are those, you know, oral accounts? But it's shameful so, too because they weren't allowed into the country. They were shuffled off and away immediately. I think that's probably why that people, when something like that happens and something is swept under the carpet, there isn't going to be the same level of documentation. Well, that that's certainly correct. I mean, if you if you go back now and look at a material that was always there. I mean, we, we didn't, you know, we didn't, uh, we just put a lot of jigsaw puzzle pieces together more than anything. But, but if you exactly look at right. accounts, it, was, it was very forensic. It was, you, it, you performed an, uh, an autopsy for lack of a better word on, on, on their story. And you, you were able in, in, in a beautifully told dramatic way, uh, which is shows your gift as a storyteller, you were able to find what happened to these six 
uh, Chinese gentleman, and uh, some uh, there were so many aha moments. I, I, I'm cautious about how much I want to uh, spoil <laughs> here in the podcast for anybody that wants to see it. But there, there were repeated moments just when you thought, "Oh, I know where this is going." There was like, "You've got to be kidding me!" You, you know, and you and you find out that that um, uh, the the whole the whole notions of of class which uh, seem to come and go with the Titanic story. Some people don't think that there were issues of class, but in, there certainly were. And the stories of uh, of what happened to them, there there were so many of those moments. So uh, it, talk to that too, please, about the 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 investigation that went on. Because, I mean, it made, yes, you put the puzzle pieces together, but nobody was looking for them before you. So... So during Arthur's and my work, you know, we, so we're working on this completely different story <laughs> that we're just going to happen to compare to Titanic so that it makes sense for the audience. And then at this point, you know, late at night, instead of staring at the ceiling and thinking about the shipwreck I was supposed to be thinking about, of course, I'm thinking about Titanic and I'm thinking about, you know, the Chinese passengers and what happened to them. So at some point I had to have a come to Titanic moment with, with Arthur and, and say to him, I think we're working on the wrong story. And that's a very, I mean, imagine if in the middle of, you know, Ship of Dreams, you had uh, said, you know, I think we're going to do something else here. You know, it, it's a, especially when you're six or seven months down the track, you know, you think like, what, why all of a sudden are we not doing this? So it the took me- The one thing I did learn took, that it's the nature of documentary. I, I you know, my my first feature film was a, was a narrative that I wrote. I could put anything in it I wanted, but you do have to let the documentary lead you and find its story. I knew that going in that, you know, actually even writing a script, you've got to write a script. It's like about what? I don't know what, I want to know what's going to happen. And it unfolds itself just as you're explaining, but six or seven months down the road must've been a little bit daunting at the time how did he take it um he was not so excited um <laughs> he, he you know he thought titanic was a very mainstream story that there wasn't anything left to explore on it um that certainly doing the kind of story that we do um that that there just wasn't going to be anything new to bring out that it wasn't going to sustain itself over you know 90 or 100 minutes um, and then, but really when he started to talk to Chinese friends of his and, and said, you know, I'm thinking about this Titanic thing and whatever, you know, Chinese passengers on Titanic and all of them sort of reacted the same way, which was there were Chinese passengers on Titanic. You know, it was, it was really not known, excuse me, to them or, or to anyone else, you know, very widely at the time. So I think that really helped. Um, so then we spent about 90 days. I think we set a, a calendar target of 90 days to say, all right, let's try to disprove this to ourselves. First of all, let's see if there's enough material to work with. And then let's try to disprove to ourselves. Let's see if anybody else has done anything on it. You know, let's see what stopped them, if, if anybody had. And then also we're going to have to try to find some family members and so forth. So at the end of the 90 days, we had a few leads and um, we realized that we were going to spend a lot of time banging our heads against the wall about the names, uh, which I'll get to in a second. And, you know, we thought, okay, this is, this is worth continuing. Let's, let's keep going. We can always go back to this other story we have, but, but let's see where this takes us. And so like the any names, other story about real people, it's, uh, I mean, real people bring real emotions and that's this it's not your film is not just a clinical film either as can as compelling as the mystery is it's about real people and you 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 talk to real people and you know, when, when when we meet um uh, titanic victims uh survivors it becomes it becomes even more real and more emotional and and you you have that you have all the elements i mean it was it was tough going in the beginning because we 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 really scoured you know especially from the 100th anniversary we really scoured accounts and and um just you know interviews that people had done and and looks at these different sort of nooks and crannies of the titanic story including the chinese passengers that you know where people were trying to find a new angle on it you know 100 years and what's what do we still not know about it and i just couldn't believe that nobody had hadn't put up their hand and said my grandfather was a you know a titanic survivor or war was a titanic passenger so if you look at the passenger list if you if you 
you know, are geeky enough to go to the National Archives. The one in New York, the 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 branch in New York, not the one in in Washington D.C., but the one in Lower Manhattan, where um, they actually have a lot of the the Titanic records. You can see the 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 list. You know, there's the original passenger list, who got on Titanic, and then there's the list of survivors, and you know who got off. And so we have these six names. So there were eight Chinese passengers, and six of them survived. And that's really what what piqued our interest was how could you know? It's a small sample size, of course. But, you know, 75 percent of the Chinese passengers survived. That's crazy. You know, you have all of the, you know, all 33 Bulgarians die. You know, what, what just what's why, you know, that 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 kind of thing really drove us. So when we're looking at the names, you know, as Arthur and I both um, have both studied Mandarin Chinese, but we didn't know any of the other dialects. We haven't studied them. So we're looking at these Romanized names. And we're trying to figure out, well, okay, it's 1912. Where did these guys come from in China? You know, they were all listed as being from Hong Kong, but are these Cantonese names? They're all two names at the time. Three names, you know, were, were, was more common. You know, where where do we start? You know, are these are these names that came from passports? Are these names that came from, you know, did their employer give these names? You know, so it's just, and then... You know, it wasn't a huge discovery, let's say, but but we realized that one of the names, if you look closely at the um, at the handwriting on the on the, the the roster, it doesn't say it for years. That name had been written as Ali, A-L-I, like like Muhammad Ali, Ali Lam, L-A-M. But if you really look at it, it says ah, A-H-L-A-M. And, and what that told us was that it's a nickname. Alam is like being called, you know, little Jimmy, you know, it's just, and we thought, okay, well, great. All right. At least we know that these are names that maybe they gave, but they're not necessarily official names. So that's good news. On one hand, it's bad news because now we're not going to find too many papers with that name on it. Am I right in thinking they were sailors though? They were military or is that not true? Okay. So, so here's where a lot of the confusion about their story comes in. They they were professional sa uh, sailors. They were they were mariners, but they were not part of Titanic's crew. Okay, a lot of times because that was their profession, everyone says, "Oh, well, they were Titanic's crew," and you know that that that's why they were on the ship. No, that was not it. They were they were professional mariners, but they were being seconded from their employer, the the Donald Line, not the Donaldson Line, as it's the, which was a passenger liner. That was that's commonly um, uh, miswritten that way, but but to they were being seconded from the UK operations of of the Donald Line, which was essentially a cargo company, a fruit boat company. They were being seconded from the UK over to the US lines. Now Chinese sailors, even though they were they were not able to enter the United States legally at that point because of the Chinese Exclusion Act, they could work on ships that were traveling up and down the North American coast. Um, and these guys so, couldn't get off the Carpathia, could they? I mean, is that is that right? Is that when, when they basically they survived only to have to turn around and get out? That That's correct. Yeah. I mean, they were so they were there to meet their ship. The reason they were on Titanic was because they were meeting a ship on which they were then going to work in the engine room or in the kitchen, um, the Aneta. And um, but once because it was known that they were on board unlike all the other passengers who received some kind of aid or family came and met them or you know just there was someone in some capacity there to meet them even if it was the salvation army uh the people that that met the six chinese passengers were essentially the the, the equivalent of today's you know immigration service um and they kept them on on carpathia overnight uh, they were not allowed to get off the ship, which is which is both good and bad. A Carpathia was probably more comfortable than any place they would have ended up. But you know, they they probably didn't get to do all the things they thought they would get to do in New York. You know, get a fresh set of clothes, get a decent Chinese meal. You know, maybe send a letter or two. They had no way to, you know, notify anyone about the 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 death of the other two Chinese passengers if they happened to be related or they happened to be friends. So you know. The next morning, they spend another night on Carpathia, and then they're whisked over to. If you, for anyone who lives in in Manhattan or or knows New York, um, if the the helicopter landing pad 
uh, which I believe is Pier 11. That's just yeah. about where uh, they were they were going to, um, they would have gotten on. They got on on Pier 9. Pier 9 doesn't exist anymore. Um, but but yeah, so it's, you know, the, it, it wasn't a warm welcome. You know, it was not, uh, nobody lifted the lamp again to the, to the golden door for them at that point. And then, you know, probably... I don't know. I, I'm I'm sure they were dealing with a fair bit of shock and sadness over the loss of their fellow passengers, but at the same time they had just lost everything. So yeah, well, they let alone the experience to have a job to go to. You know, they, <laughs> well, they the experience and, right, well, of being in the water. And uh, yeah. you, one of the things I found most compelling uh, in in your documentary is the way you uh, the, to sort of debunk the rumor that they had used some nefarious methods to survive, that they had maybe disguised themselves as women or or at the at the cost of somebody else's life, because there was so much prejudice anyway against the Chinese. Uh, you know, did they steal into the lifeboat somehow? Did they take the place of somebody else that should have gotten those? Those places and you recreated the lifeboats, <laughs> which I thought, which was brilliant. And so, I mean, it was not just compelling um, uh, mystery solving, but uh, it was visually compelling to watch you to do that and test it out. Uh, speak a little bit about that, if you can. You know, when we when we got into this, I mean, our, you know, Arthur is a fantastic documentarian of process and emotion. You know, he doesn't really care whether we find anything, but he really hopes that we're really angry or really, <laughs> really happy about it at the end and um, and show it along the way. You know, nothing, nothing better than a thrown, you know, mobile phone to uh, express how somebody feels at a particular moment. And let's face it, how do you how do you show people looking at archival photos and make it interesting? You know, it's just not, you know, it's just not going to be that exciting. But, you know, when I started to look at, at what we were intended to do, I thought, you know, one of the reasons that, that the, um, you know, that the ongoing slander, frankly, of the Chinese passengers has continued for over a century is because people just kept repeating the same story. And I thought, if we're going to do this, we need to do this in a way that the evidence speaks, not the Brooklyn Eagle, uh, you know, from 1912. We need to know, was this physically, you know, physics will tell the story. Science will tell the story, not some, you know, record from from 100 years ago. And building the lifeboat was the only way to do that. And I remember the day that I told Arthur about it and I said, well, we're going to build a lifeboat. And he said, what do you know about building boats? And I said, absolutely <laughs> nothing. And I don't need to know anything about it because I'm going to find a group of people who do and they're going to work with us. And I, you know, I really had no idea at that moment. I, I thought, well, maybe an international school, but I really didn't, you know, I didn't have a Rolodex full of boat, boat builders, but the same thing is true with the cold water. You know, it, all of these things can be tested. All of these things, especially now, can be modeled. And you got cold in the film. You uh, you put your body to the test. I did indeed, and and you know, but really, that was the only way. We had no agenda when we started to to, you know, make the the documentary. We had no agenda to say, oh, you know, the Chinese have been maligned or what. That wasn't our intent at all. Um, that's where the chips fell, but that that really is not what we set out to do. What we wanted to do was find out what actually happened. And the only way to do that was by building a life-size model. Cause we figured if we build a small model, I mean, you both know what the Titanic community is like. Okay. It is a private club, but there are certain people you don't <laughs> want to sit next to at dinner, you know? So, uh, you know, I had those voices in the back of my head the whole time, what they were going to say, how they were going to try to debunk it. And I thought the only way to do this is to, is to do it life size because if we do it, you know, one tenth, and we and we you know try to stick Kens and Barbies underneath the seats, they're going to say, ah, oh, that's not an accurate representation. So we had to we had is, to do is it with that real where James real Cameron boat. came in because Jim Jim would have had a lot of uh, research and background to to fold into to that part of it, or what was he involved in other parts of the film? So if there's ever a DVD release, um, there there may be a short section called, you know, what did Jim, what did James Cameron know and when did he know it? The extra um, because that was <laughs> that was one of our early questions. You know, once we once we saw the deleted scene, saw that a Chinese passenger was being rescued, 
knowing that that was was a story that was based on fact, we thought, okay, well, Cameron knew about this. So if Cameron knew, how much of the Chinese story does he know? And and you know, is there a file sitting around with you know labeled Chinese passengers? Um, and did it did it you know did it inspire the Jack and Rose ending? You know, gee, it seems similar. Rescue from the water, floating on a board. Okay. Um, so, you know, I had met, uh, Cameron in, uh, Beijing in 2011, uh, at a press conference and I met some of the folks around him and I stored all those contacts for a rainy day. And, you know, that, that rainy day came around in like 2018. And so, you know, I, I sort of knew you know, I didn't know him personally, certainly, but I, I sort of, you know, knew people around him from the Explorers Club. Um, and uh, Arthur, by the same token, knew some people from the film industry. And so we just tried to sort of, you know, meet in the middle with our contacts. And, um, you know, when we were finally able to get his attention, because he was, you know, neck deep in Avatar, um, when we were finally able to get his attention, you know, he was really excited about it. And because, I mean, he say what you like about the the film or the man or whatever he is a bona fide titanic expert you know and he never gets enough credit for it and i think he never gets to spend enough time on it especially now but um i do call and, him and the we, original titaniac he he's the uh, absolutely he's the he's the full he's the he's the yeah. he's the thing that set this all off in the last 25 years and uh, even the people who love to discredit the film because it's not true to history miss the point that he reignited and ignited um, a, a, a whole new generation of people to take interest, young people to take interest in this story and have empathy for it. Absolutely. I mean, and once we saw, you know, if you if you watch Titanic carefully, you see a, a Chinese passenger. There's not eight Chinese passengers, right. but you see a single Chinese passenger pop up in the background. I mean, you know, to, to Cameron's credit, you know, the, the the Titanic passengers, especially the third class passengers, were a very diverse group. And and if you look at the background, if you can take your eyes off of Leo for a moment, you know you'll see that the other folks in in uh, third class are you know they they have very different costumes, they have very different appearances. That you know it's he he did a good job of making sure that there was a representation of you know a, a wider group than just you know, a, a bunch of Irishmen, I say, my grandmother's maiden name was Donahue. So, you know, I'm, I'm not, not casting aspersions on my own people, but, you know, so, um, so we just, we felt that we had a real reason to, to ask him about this. We wanted to get him talking about it on film. What did he know about it? Could he point us in a particular direction? Did it inspire the Jack and Rose ending? You know, we didn't, we never thought like, oh, come on, let's see if we can get, you know, Cameron involved and whatever. And and then once, you know, we got his attention. So so it came down to we we were basically wrapped. We we, you know, we were done. And it was July 2019. Film was due out in April. We had to to go to, go to post. And we just kind of went back to him and said, look, it, you know, we appreciate that you're super busy. But, you know, we we got to do this. You know, if, if you if you want to participate, that's great. And our offer to him had always been, we'll take any 15 minutes you have anywhere in the world. OK, so pro tip when you ask someone, you know, of, of James James Cameron's caliber, for, you know, when you make him that kind of offer make it 30 minutes. OK, because <laughs> you are going to go anywhere in the world, but at least ask where did you end up filming him? There. So we were supposed to go to LA uh, that that July Fourth weekend, two thousand nineteen, and there was an earthquake there, and so he's like, "Okay, not not going to LA, forget it." So he said, "Well, if you want this interview, you got to come to Wellington, New Zealand." We said, "Okay." So we flew down to Wellington. I think I was there sixty hours. I think Arthur was there thirty six. Um, charming little town. I think we had, you know, two or three full meals <laughs> while we were there. Um, but yeah, I mean, we went down and he was great and he, you know, was exceptionally gracious. You can see the answers in the film. Um, I won't give them away, but, um, you know, he really, you know, afterwards he said, Hey, you know, what, what else can I do for you? I think this is a great project. What else can I do for you? 
And, and um, you know, he was the one who proposed that he executive produced the film. And that made such a huge difference to us because it allowed us to use footage from his film that, that otherwise we never would have gotten, not to mention, you know, his expert presence. So, um, well, you know, we're, and you also super grateful. Like in Ship of Dreams, Titanic Movie Diaries, you have, your art director did a marvelous job of using illustrations as well. I mean, the, the, as in Ship of Dreams as well, with with the illustrations that Alexandra employed. But to have to just to have so many uh, of those elements from the music uh, illustrations. Yes, clips are valuable too, uh, certainly in this case. But uh, at the end of the day, it is the story. So we have a couple of the things I want to talk to you about before we before we get to the end of our of our episode here. So I, I do want to just remind uh, listeners that The Six, spelled at S-I-X, the six documentary.com is where you can uh, find out more information about seeing this film. And it's it's done well in festivals. It's I mean, it's completely compelling. It's uh, it's it's quite an achievement. Uh, and you also have, because you, you mentioned at the top of this podcast about your uh, being in New Jersey, you have a New Jersey themed Titanic podcast. I do. So um, the, the podcast was Arthur's idea. because uh, So I, I moved back uh, to New Jersey from, from China. After being in China for 25 years, I moved back a couple of years ago. And, um, you know, I wanted to keep doing the kind of work that I was doing, you know, historical research and maritime history and those kinds of things. And New Jersey certainly has a rich maritime history. It doesn't have a specific Titanic history or so, I thought. Um, but I thought, well, what, you know, what can I do that would sort of keep me engaged in the same way? So, you know, again, I just started up with Encyclopedia Titanica and Google and, you know, just sort of the easy open source references. And uh, I started to realize that there were a lot of Titanic passengers and crew who had a significant tie to New Jersey. Either they lived, they were from here, they were coming here. Um or you know they 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 died here perhaps uh, they're buried here, um, and I thought okay well that's interesting that'll that'll keep me busy and originally I just wanted to do it as a book I just wanted to kind of do it as a as a book that you'd buy in a Jersey Shore gift shop you know um, but Arthur suggested that I do it as a podcast and I I you know credit to both of you because podcasting has been so much of a challenge for me it's not. It's not the storytelling, just it's just the technical elements that that really bog me down. I, I just I'm not particularly technically inclined, and and so, you know, I, I luckily I'm using a, an outside editor, uh, Alexia, uh, from Co Crow's Nest Studios um, down in in Austin, Texas. She has a podcast called Titanic Talk Line. We're all so, related. Um, it's been, she's been a big help, and um, you know, just it's just a question of putting the stories together. But, but what I love about it is that first of all, I think I'm up to 60 names now who have one kind of connection or another. And what I like about it is that it, it allows me to look at, at very different aspects of the Titanic story The the next, the, the, the most recent episode, um, you know, it's just a chance to look at, at the third class passengers and there are, there are opportunities for escape. You know, why did so many, women and children die on a ship where women and children first at least and if not women and children only was was supposedly the rule so I, what i like I, about I've it i've always is not, asked if my my first class passenger character survived did i get in a lifeboat and <laughs> I, I didn't get to get in a lifeboat but i have to assume oh yeah i have to assume that she did because one of the numbers I heard was that more first class women survived than third class children. And that right yes. there says it. Well, Stephen, yeah. you told me yeah. over our lunch, I've, if I'm correct, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think I was drinking at that lunch, but I seem to recall that, uh, <laughs> that um, didn't you tell me that more second class men died? Did, it, there was a disproportionate amount and, and that sort of had to go with the whole um, the the men stay behind mentality like the third class yeah. men they got in the water so they you know were had more of a chance than the second class men who sort of felt like they had to through chivalry stay behind so so yes that's correct i think i only 14 out of 100 and something i i i have it written on a post-it somewhere but you know only 14 out of 100 and something um wow second class male passengers survived. They had a very, very low survival rate. And I think probably part of that was access 
They didn't quite get the same access as first class passengers would have. But I, I think, think also they probably as as where their doors were situated, where the stairways and the doors, those doors were locked. I mean, we see that in the film. And of course, that's been a controversial talking point as well. But it could have been something simple as logistics. It certainly could have. I think the second class passengers might or the second class male passengers might have felt very much like their their first class counterparts that hey, I'm a gentleman and and I dare not, you know, enter a boat. And therefore, you know, they would have had to, I mean, I think Jack Thayer is a second class passenger. So we can, you know, we can learn more about that from his account. Um, the only Japanese think, you know, Jack who, was first. I think you're thinking of Lawrence Beasley. Lawrence Beasley was you are, the, Yes, you are yeah. correct. Yes, yes, that's right. So, you know, Beasley, um, you know, the, the Beasley account is is good for sort of, you know, seeing what the situation of the second class men was. Um, you know, the, the only Japanese passenger that was on board, he survived. Uh, he was a second class passenger. He, he took two shots at it and finally got it. Uh, he was, he was, you know, pushed away from one boat and finally got into another, um, and then was, you know, pilloried for the rest of his life for surviving, you know, how dare he take, take someone's seat. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it just Which being able to look at those because stories. The lifeboats weren't full. People weren't getting into the lifeboats. They didn't. They didn't want to. I'm going to be the. I'm the going chip. to be the party pooper. I have to. I'm. I'm looking at the clock, and we're going to have to wind this up sadly. <laughs> um, the marvelous thing is that we're in each other's clutches. Um, I don't know what the connection could be to New Jersey. Maybe a Bruce Springsteen is a Titanic fan, but we've got to he do is. something. I well, he, he is. He yeah. Is. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> I could, you yeah. know, he's uh, as soon as he gets over his peptic ulcer or whatever it is, he's gonna yeah. maybe he can do a version of My Heart Will Go On. Um, the, <laughs> can Steven you imagine? Wacker. Okay, no, I need I to hear imagine. that now. <laughs> I, I, I can't, I cannot imagine that. <laughs> But but, 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 but but Bruce could do it. I know he's got it in him to do it. But I, I well, I, I can't imagine it at the moment. He's uh, he's a Jersey boy who likes the Titanic, and uh, so are you. So we're grateful to you, Stephen Schwenker. We love the six, and now you're stuck with us. Uh, we're friends for life. Thank you Great. so we'll much. Thank you, Stephen. It, 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 it's an honor and not a curse. So thank you, thank you both for having me. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review. And if you'd like to hear more podcasts like this, hit the subscribe button. For information on where you can see Ship of Dreams, Titanic Movie Diaries, go to shipofdreamsfilm.com. Titanic Talk is a production of Ship of Dreams Film Limited. To celebrate Season 2 of Titanic Talk, we've launched a line of Titanic Talk merch. A cap, a mug, a tote a t-shirt or a hoodie, you'll be sure to find a unique gift for the Titaniac in your life. Look for the link in the notes and on Instagram or go to bit.ly forward slash Titanic Talk Shop.